Was that a little belch? Did you belch? Hmm? Why do you only do that on camera? It was the grill. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, Booktube, <laughs> and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is my tour through my Penguin Classic wall, and we've had some ups and downs lately, mostly ups. The last batch of penguins that we've done, I can't help but notice that there have been quite a few Steve highlights. Uh, we had the King James Bible, at long last, in a Black Spine Penguin Classic. We had the unabridged Boswell's Life of Johnson, in a, in a, at long last, in a Penguin Classic. Uh, we had the poetry of John Donne which I, I might have sounded a little harsh on him, but I absolutely love him. I love his poetry. We had The Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> the Hound of the Baskervilles. It wouldn't have as much plot device if he was only 10 pounds. He's a monstrous hound. You only think you are, but you're actually the size of a paperweight. <laughs> you're just tiny. You're a tiny little thing. <laughs> You'd never know it. She screams at other dogs. Ten times her size on our walks. Screams at them to stop and present their papers. <laughs> Just stand still while I ex examine you and stand up on you and whatnot, and then you may go. <laughs> uh, we also had mixed in that batch the Princess Casamassima, which I like. I like very much. But there's no Henry James that sends me over the moon. Uh, and I have delighted in that video on Henry James. I talked about how there are plenty of people I've known in my life who have, who are sent over the moon by Henry James and how much that delights me. To hold out the prospect, for instance, that I might do that myself, that that might happen to me one day. And in response to that video, I heard from a whole bunch of people who love Henry James dearly. And I view it as a mark of success. A mark of success for this channel and for the dialogue that we have set up here. I view it as a mark of success uh, that all of those people who emailed me and said, I couldn't live without Henry James. He is what, of what's your channel, you describe some literary figures as, quote, old friends. He is an old friend. I cannot imagine my reading life without him. I heard from a great number of people who feel that way, and not one of them had their hackles up. Not one of them wrote that way like, oh my God, you have threatened me by saying that you're not in love with my favorite author. That threatens me. Not one person did that, because I like to believe that is the, the dialogue that we have set up here. That we can violently disagree with each other about these things and still be friends. And maybe even hope that the, that we can do some convincing. I've convinced a lot of you of some things, and a lot of you have convinced me of things. I love that. Absolutely love I view it as a mark of success. That, that such dialogue is possible. That such conversations are possible. Uh, and today's Penguin uh, goes back to being a Steve book. <laughs> it goes back to being a book I can't live without. An old friend, like Boswell, like The Hound of the Baskervilles, like the King James Bible. Right in that same category, and only randomly placed. I, I don't believe these, that I was thinking of that, because if, if I were thinking that, then there would be other books that would be with these that aren't. So I think it's just random chance. But today... Today's Black Spine Penguin Classic is The Diary of Samuel Pepys. This is Robert Latham's The Shorter Pepys that came out as a big, very pretty hardcover. Uh, and then Penguin took it for their edition of Samuel Pepys. As opposed to a, a much shorter, I think they did a much shorter Pepys selection earlier than this. This is generous. Uh, I have mentioned before, Samuel Pepys was a, uh, a Royal Navy official. Uh, the restoration of, of King Charles, and he he kept a diary for ten years, uh, and uh, the diary is strangely unselfconscious. It for such a for such a preening self-conscious man, the diary is very much him working out just an inner dialogue, which is incredible to do, uh, because as as an official in the government, he had to know the scandal that would erupt around him if anyone actually found this thing. He did it anyway. And the, uh, the entries can be amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we'll get to that. But quite a few of the entries, I don't know how many of you keep personal, personal journals. I do. I've kept a personal journal forever. And some of the entries just aren't as good as others. Some you're just hurried. Some you're post-dating. A lot of, I don't do it, but a lot of people post-date. So 
they will they will get to Friday and they will go back and make entries for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because they missed those days. But they they didn't write anything on those days, but they want a record of those days. Uh, I don't do that because it adds uh, hindsight to those days in a way that is fraudulent. It fra you're you're uh, you're misrepresenting those days yourself in those days if you're not writing about them as they lived. But Peeps does that quite a bit, and quite a few of his entries are basically. Uh, little day book entries. I, uh, I've had those. I've kept a little day book in addition to a journal where you just not jot down dash here a calendar or an, a, an agenda of some kind or other. You, 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 where I would jot down where I went was here at 10, was here at 10.30. I would make a little mark for how much money I spent and where I spent it. Uh, no particular reason, no no historical value whatsoever, and and I, nothing in the way of consulting. I virtually never consulted those those little agenda pocket diary things. Uh, but Peeves didn't have one of those. He just had one book, and so quite a few of his entries are that. And they might be of interest to uh, a historian of Peeves, a biographer of Peeves, or maybe a. a a particular local historian of one particular area in Shoreditch or Deptford or wherever, but they are no they are of no interest whatsoever to the general reader. So I've mentioned before that although I, I consider abridgments of literary classics to be anathema, I don't consider an abridgment of Pepys' diary to be anathema because it's not a literary classic. It has no literary merit whatsoever. Uh, it has something else, some other merit to it, but it is entirely possible. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's entirely possible to do a really good abridgment of Peeps from which you will want nothing more. And this, the shorter Peeps, comes about as close as you could get. I might maybe want a hundred more pages, but this comes about as close as you could get. The, the abridger here went through the original diaries, which are, there are many unabridged Peepses. He went through the original diaries and cut out all of those make weight factual entries all the ones that have that could have poss no possible interest to any reader who is not an extreme specialist he cut out all of those and he adds a generous amount of uh, annotations so that you know peeps never identifies anybody that he's talking about in the in these entries and knowing who they are helps a lot to understand their meaning when he's talking about proper names it helps you a lot to know that he's talking about his father and his brother for instance or his wife's family or the particular na the, uh, the particular person that he's working with or for in the government or the particular place where he sees a shakespeare play or something like that annotations are vital to peeps vital because most people will not be scholars of this period so they won't know otherwise but uh, you can do those annotations on an abridged peeps and have them work just fine and they do in this case this is the peeps to have uh, unless you want the unabridged and the unabridged you won't want <laughs> you won't want it I know that flies in the face in any other case for uh, for penguin classics for instance I would almost certainly be against it in, in almost every other case if I had I would never keep a Penguin Classic abridged War and Peace, for instance, an abridged Moby Dick. I would never keep it. Uh, but the, I, I keep and consult often shorter peeps because I know what's... I read and know very intimately the unabridged peeps, and I know what's missing from these volumes, and it's nothing. It's nothing at all. Went to such and such a place, spent so much money home by such and such a time. Not of interest. Whereas... The other entries that Peeps writes, the ones that are of interest, you can tell in a minute when you're reading through the Unabridged what you would want and what you wouldn't want for a volume like this. And the point that I made in earlier videos is that uh, given your page count, this is what, 800 pages? Uh, a thousand. Given a thousand pages, anybody who knows the Unabridged Peeps would come up with about the same selections. That is rare, but that would happen. when it, With Peeps, it would definitely happen. Because when you're reading The Underbridge, you know right away just by looking what you're going to want to keep and what you're not. What has general interest and what doesn't. So in this case, there would be very little difference between editors except in terms of their annotations and their introduction. Both are fantastic in this case. And what you get from Peeps, he kept this diary for 10 years. On a good day, he would finish with all the bustle and hustle that he had to do. All the stuff with his wife and his servants who are never good enough, they're always lazy and two-timing him, all the stuff with his bosses, all the stuff with his, his peers and his dependents and his family. All, when he was done with all of that stuff, when he was done with everything, on a good day, he would then sit and write in his journal. 
a pressy of what happened, but also impressions. What he liked and what he didn't like. What he thought of it. Always very brief. There's almost never a, a Peeps entry that doesn't feel hurried. But always intensely honest. So honest that you don't get the sense that Peeps thought that the world was reading over his shoulder. That You do get that sense sometimes, even with inveterate diarists. Even sometimes with uh, James Boswell, who is the only other famous figure I can compare to Peeps. Boswell's London di diaries... Very much, 90% of the time, read as if he had no idea that anyone was going to read them other than him. In fact, they often read just like Peeps, as if he had no idea that he was writing them. They read like transcriptions of his thoughts at the end of a day. The thoughts you have that run through your head before you go to sleep. And that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Those of you who have kept a journal will know how hard that is. Not that Peeps worked at it. I just think he was wired that way. But... Writing that kind of an entry where you do no special pleading for yourself or anybody else, where you don't try to make yourself look better or worse, where you don't try to shape the scene, that kind of thing is incredibly rare. Peeps does it all the time. All the time in this diary. And it is incredible. It's an amazing experience to get through. You're, again, you're not reading anything literary. You're not reading, you're not reading any particularly deep thoughts. <laughs> Peeps was not a particularly deep thinker. He never even tries. But you are reading a person, and there is no artifice. You're, the, the veil of the years in between you and him falls away in an instant. And suddenly you're reading about someone who quarrels with someone that he loves, knows the whole time that he's quarreling with them, that he's in the wrong, insists that he's in the right, and hates himself for it, and admits all of that to his diary. Someone who wakes up in the middle of the night and is absolutely sure that a shadow on the other side of the room is an intruder who's just standing there patiently, making no noise at all. And is sure of that for hours of terror at night until the moon strikes a certain window panel correctly and he sees that it's nothing. But he writes it in his diary. That's the sort of thing most people would leave out. The casual brutalities that he inflicts on his wife, he admits them all. He often admits them in the context of regretting them. But how many writers would admit them? Almost none. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, the, the Peeps, his diary is famous for two things. One is that he confesses all of his amorous adventures. He was a lech. Uh, he wasn't faithful to his wife at all. He was a lech. And, uh, a woman, young, old, uh, poor, rich, known in society, unknown in society, barely had to glance in his direction before he was smitten, and often he would impose himself and then write about it. <laughs> uh, and that the diary is famous for that because it's got a kind of a licentious air about it. And it's, it's also famous because Pepys was an eyewitness to a whole bunch of things and wrote, he was keeping a diary, so he, he wrote about them. The Great Fire of London, the Plague of London, the, the Restoration itself. He was, he was a, there for all of it, and he's not, he's not a particularly acute observer, but that makes him all the more valuable because he's just writing what he saw. He's not trying to spin it in any way, so you can trust him. Also, for, for cultural historians, he's invaluable because he was often at the theater and tells us about what was playing and what he liked and who was there and what the, the, what the audience was like, what the performance was like. That's invaluable. Uh, those are the two things that this diary is most famous for. It's contemporaneous eyewitnesses. You won't get an anthology of eyewitness literature without Peeps showing up at least a few times. And it's backstairs, it's below stairs adventures. Uh, which have often had people compare this author to, for instance, the, the memoirs of Casanova. Uh, Casanova had literary talent. <laughs> Peeps did not have any literary talent. But I think when you're reading these entries, there are greater things. Those are easy. Those are low-hanging fruit. They're, they're, those are easy for people to latch onto when describing this diary. Uh, there's higher-hanging fruit. <laughs> there's, I think there's stuff that most readers will come away with remembering more. The intensely human details, the awkwardness of his family, especially when he started to rise in the world and they did not. Uh, his, uh, I think it would be fair to say, obsession with money. He is, he is obsessed with... What was that? What was that noise you made? I'm trying to talk about peeps, baby bean. Do you want to see your fans again? Is that why you're hoarsely growling? Huh? <laughs> she makes such strange noises. She, I swear she does. She's constantly gurgling and, and uh, hacking as if she had something in her throat, but she doesn't. She just, you don't. You don't. You just, and when she's out, when we're out and about, the only way she knows how to greet people is by growling at them. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you're also going to come, like I mentioned, Peeps is obsessed with money because he, he remembers when he had none. And now, although he is as honest as his time will permit, he wants to make a, a, a cut of whatever kind of thing he's doing, if it's legal. Uh, and he often notes to the reader how much money he's worth in the world. You know, no banks, no lines of credit, no, no savings account, no ATM machines. What he has of money is what he has of money. Um, and he's also uh, remembers his own history. Specifically, famously, uh, all throughout the diary, he, every year he celebrates the anniversary of the day that he was, quote, cut for the stone, where he had a kidney stone, and it was bad, and it was painful, and it would like have killed him, and he submitted himself to the surgery of the day to have it removed. And the reason that he celebrated uh, the, the success of that surgery is because he was perfectly aware that he could have died of the surgery. <laughs> perfectly aware of that. It was, an ag it was an ordeal. It was nothing to help him at all. And no knowledge that his, that his surgeon had any idea what he was doing. He did live, and he celebrates that day every year. Although there's one year, there's one year in this diary where he has a bad head cold, and it just happens to fall on the day of his anniversary, and he laments about that. <laughs> but it's all in the diary. It's all there, which is amazing. It's not like we have to infer any of this. Now, Peeps led a fascinating life. Outside of his diary, he led a fascinating life. And there was, I think there was a four-volume biography of him. There was Claire Tomlin's biography of him. There have been many others. And any good Peeps edition, including this one, will give you also a potted biography. And there have been some other books. Uh, one in particular on the scandal that, uh, that almost enveloped him later in his life. But the diary is something else again. I maintain, like I said, that most readers of this thing will not come away from it thinking that was a fascinating glimpse into the era of Restoration London. Most people will not come away from this thinking that. Instead, they'll come away dazed a little and wondering how on earth it is that I feel like I know someone who died 500 years ago. That is the experience of the Peeps of Peeps' diary. That is the wonder of it. That is why people come back to it over and over again, because it is a, a completely open self-portrait. Peeps wrote this in a very thin kind of code, a code that anyone just glancing at it could break. Some of it he did. And uh, there is evidence, I think, convincing evidence, that he probably guessed somewhere down the line that someone would read this. But when he was in the act of writing, no. No, not at all. When he's in the act of writing, he is he is just confessing himself onto the page in a way that is actually uh, an ideal to be striven for for journalists, for people who keep journals. Uh, most of them don't do it. Most of the journals that people have let me read are very excruciatingly self-conscious. And I try to write more like Peeps than like that kind of journal keeping, but most people don't do it. Most contemporary journal writers of his day, most con uh, journal writers in the century since have not managed to do it. Peeps does it gloriously. Uh, so your Penguin Classic today is the strongest possible recommend. I'm not sure that I would recommend this unless you already want as much Peeps as you can get. I very much recommend this, hands down, is the best one-volume Peeps Diary edition that exists. Hands down. I'm so happy that it happens to be a Penguin Classic. But Peeps is online. There are websites that will give you the Peeps Diary entry for that day. You can learn without without diving headfirst into the deepest, into the the biggest selected peeps that you can get. You can learn very quickly whether or not this is of any interest to you. I would give it a little while, read a few entries, let them mull around in your head. I bet you'll fall under the spell. I bet you'll want to read more. Uh, so if that is true, once that is true, and you know this isn't a waste of your time, then, of course, this is the peeps that I recommend. Not just as a Penguin Classic, but because this is the best one-volume abridgment that there is. Uh, so that's, that's going to do it for today. That's your Penguin Classic for today. And we'll see if tomorrow is another... I mean, the King James Bible in a Penguin Classic. Boswell's Life of Johnson, unabridged, in a Penguin Classic. The Poetry of John Donne, in a Penguin Classic. The Hound of the Baskervilles, in a Penguin Classic. Now we have the, the Diary of Peeps, in a Penguin Classic. Tomorrow's Penguin will have a lot to live up to. We'll see if it can manage to do that. <laughs> so we'll reconvene then. Thank you, Book Two.